He is the longest serving nonviolent federal offender, and uh, he was originally sentenced for uh, drug charges. Uh, in fact, the prosecutors only recommended, I think, like 40 months in prison, and the judge sentenced him to life without parole. There was a long series of appeals, and it actually went back to the judge a couple of times, and every time I went back to him, he sentenced him to the same thing. Uh, and he wound up serving 32 years in prison for marijuana-related offenses, uh, which is, you know, uh, again, wouldn't even be a crime in many states now. Uh, he was finally released in 2015. Uh, he, I think, serves as a cautionary tale to what our justice system can become if it's uh, not, you know, carefully monitored and if we don't keep our eye on the, the purpose of the justice system, uh, which is not to be gratuitously punitive, but to actually enact justice. Uh, here is somebody who never committed a violent crime, never hurt anybody, and, uh, you know, wound up spending more than three decades in prison. Well, you, you have to understand the time, and, and that's true of almost everything that happens in history. Uh, in the early 80s, right after President Reagan was elected, we adopted this very tough on crime philosophy, which permeated the entire criminal justice system, but uh, particularly drug crimes. You may remember Nancy Reagan's big issue was just say no, you know, quote, drugs were considered among the worst things that you can be involved in. And so we enacted uh, draconian punishments. In fact, in some cases, we enhanced already draconian punishments. If you look at, for example, the Rockefeller laws in New York, um, and we enacted these three strike laws that even if you have very, very minor offenses, if you commit three of them, uh, then you go away for life without parole. Uh, it, this led, you know, just for example, in Pennsylvania, uh, we had between five and 7,000 prisoners between 1940 and 1980. It would fluctuate over 40 years, very stable. Uh, this new philosophy was enacted early 80s, um, and we went up from between five and 7,000 to about 55 to 60,000 uh, prisoners. Um, we were not by the way, statistically any safer as a result of that than we were before doing that. But that resulted in Pennsylvania uh, in us having to build a new prison on average every year at a cost of about 300 million to build and about 50 million a year to run to the point where we went from like six prisons to 20, 25, 26 prisons. And we enacted some reforms recently, but without those reforms, there was nothing that was going to stop that. We would just have to keep building a new major prison per year forever. And so uh, George got caught up in that. Unfortunately, a lot of people got caught up in that. And I think it was, uh, frankly, an injustice that was perpetrated on, on people like George. absolutely uh, not entirely based on the theories of justice. It's based on economics. I mean, there are many ways that's true. I mean, look at private prisons. When you have private prisons, which we use in Pennsylvania, for example, for a long time, private prisons create a lobby. Any commodity where someone is selling it, they develop a lobby to encourage its sale. Well, if you have a, a lobby that's based on making sure that private prisons uh, do well financially, they have an incentive to make sure that we have as many prisoners as possible. So they lobby for tougher laws, longer sentences, harder to get parole, all of those things, because that's how they make their profit. Uh, and then there's, uh, you know, individual towns. I mean, I've been through some of these battles where, you know, let's say they want to close a prison. The town gets very upset because, you know, there are, there are jobs there, you know, whether it's uh, prison guards or uh, administrative staff or whatever. There could be hundreds of jobs there. Um, and so there is a real resistance to closing prison, which also trickles down to a resistance for criminal justice reform, which would result in, in the need to close prisons. Uh, so a, a profit is absolutely a motive in this situation. It's interesting. I remember when I first got involved in politics, that was the thing. It was in the 80s. Uh, and I remember radio commercials. Uh, I remember the very first time I realized we should not elect judges. It was a judge who was running up in Northampton County. And the radio commercial was like, rapists, child molesters, murderers. Ju I'm making the name up. But Judge Smith is coming to get you. You know, he's going to be, you know. And that's not your job as a judge to have an agenda to go out and, you know, uh, impose certain types of 
a census on certain categories of people. Your judge, job as a judge is to evaluate fairly the facts and the law of each individual case. You know, I mean, imagine in a different situation if a judge was like, you know, um, you know, trademark violation plaintiffs, you know, Judge Smith is coming to rule for you. So vote for me. You'd be like, well, that's highly inappropriate. Like, doesn't it matter what the facts of the case and the law are? But uh, for some reason, we have a blind spot when it comes to criminal justice that, you know, judges are supposed to have preconceived uh, agendas and they're supposed to actually promise to, uh, you know, come up with certain rulings and impose certain sentences, which is not the role of a judge at all. That's why we shouldn't elect judges, uh, because judges should not have the political pressure to go with popular fads at the time. If um, I am a defendant and, uh, you know, I'm an unpopular defendant, let's say I'm accused of doing something really heinous, but the law says that they have to throw the charges out because of, you know, whether it was a bad warrant or a bad search or whatever it is, or whatever the situation, if the judge is supposed to rule for me, he's supposed to rule or she is supposed to rule for me. Uh, we count on that in the criminal justice system. We're not supposed to be thinking, well, yeah, I mean, you're right on the law, but you're really a jerk. So we're going to ignore the law. Uh, and 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 you know do something else, and that is what happened in this case. I think um, this was a uh, this is a guy who did not have any prior record, as I understand it. He had a nonviolent drug you know uh, drug possession and sale of marijuana, which is again not even illegal in a lot of places now. Um, and the, again, the prosecutors even said you know they recommended about three and a half to four years of incarceration, life in prison without parole. I mean, it's just, uh, it's just obscene. And it took him 32 years to get out of prison. I've never been a believer of, handle, of handling any of these things through the criminal justice system. Uh, I think, um, you know, lifestyle choices should not be criminal. And I believe addiction should not be criminal. Addiction is recognized as a disease uh, like diabetes. You don't put people in prison for that. To put people in prison and invest all the money we invest in prison. Keep in mind, we don't invest that money in the things that would actually help, treatment, uh, education. Uh, if we invested a, a fraction of the money we invest in prison and other, it would be far more effective. But we, again, in the early 80s uh, and persisting for some time through the crime bill of the 90s and, and the, the three strike movement in many states, um, we, we just adopted the, the, the philosophy that we're just gonna punish the hell out of people and make them, and, and that's how we'll get rid of their addictions. And it just doesn't work. The requirements of being a judge are that you get the, a federal judge, uh, is that the, you get the president to appoint you and the Senate to confirm you. That's all. And that's an entirely political process. I mean, um, you know, whatever your political philosophy is, if you just look at what's happened under the Trump administration, Trump has appointed numerous people who are obviously and grotesquely unqualified. Not that's not me saying that. That's the American Bar Association saying that. That's their peers saying that. And you know, the irony is there are partisan or at least semi-partisan judges you can appoint who are qualified. <laughs> okay, but it's not only about the partisanship. It's also about rewarding contributions. It's about rewarding support. It's about rewarding loyalty. Uh, it's about doing favors for whether it's a senator for a certain state or a donor who's like, hey, my nephew wants to be a federal judge. Okay, great. These are lifetime appointments. And federal judges, as a former lawyer who practiced in front of them, federal judges have, have tremendous power, tremendous power. Um, and so, you know, you really ought to be careful about who you're appointing and why, but we're not. It's one of the many flaws in our political system currently. That said, I do think the federal system is a better system in terms of appointing rather than electing judges. As bad as appointed judges can be, elected judges can be far, far worse. And they do things like promise 
to do whatever's popular to get elected and then get retained over time. And they're reluctant. I mean, at least once you're appointed for a lifetime term, you can rule in an unpopular way and there's nothing anyone can really do about it. We, we've never impeached a judge, in, uh, certainly in modern history, for unpopular positions. There, was, there were efforts to do that with uh, Justice Douglas uh, in the 50s and 60s, but that never amounted to anything. Um, but, you know, there have been judges who did something unpopular and were not retained and were and lost their job. So what's the message is, I don't want that kind of headache. I'll just rule the way that, uh, you know, I think is going to be popular. It's not what we want in a judge. Um, and it's created all these problems. George's uh, father was apparently allegedly involved with the mob. Um, and that, that, spilled over into his case. That should never have spilled over into this case. Uh, we all have, uh, you know, parents, grandparents, ancestors who may have done, you know, God knows what they've done. That should, we should not be blamed for that. But there was pressure to do that. And the FBI has a lot of say in how sentences go. The prosecution makes recommendations on sentences, uh, and the FBI theoretically provides the investigatory and factual basis for those recommendations. The only thing I would say here is the recommendation was not, the court, the court went beyond the recommendation. So the, the FBI's influence was beyond just uh, rec uh, influencing the recommendation of sentence. It was apparently a, uh, a broader influence, which is highly inappropriate. Um, and, uh, there, you know, it, it's, it's unfortunate. I practiced criminal defense for a while, and it seems like recommending a plea to your client on a case where you could get life without parole in anything other than maybe a murder case where you can get the death penalty, which was not on the table here. So like, what did he get for his plea? Um, there, there was, there was no, you know, usually when there's a plea agreement, you can have an open plea. The open plea means that, uh, the judge sentences you whatever to whatever he or she's allowed to sentence you to. There's no agreement as to sentencing, but you would not, I would not do an open plea with a life without parole sentence as a possibility. And then you can do a binding plea, which is like, we'll plead guilty, but the judge can sentence me to more than four years or whatever it is. And if the judge, the judge can reject that plea. And and say, nope, you're going to trial. Uh, you, you would never just have an open plea with a life without parole. I don't know why. Well, I mean, as a defense lawyer, what do you get for like, what, how do you tell your client you've got something for that? <laughs> okay. Um, but maybe there was something behind the scenes. I don't know, but it seems very questionable that a defense lawyer, especially if they are close with the judge. I mean, if they're that close, you would think the judge would I mean, because you, you, there are a lot of things you can send someone to short of life without parole, which are still really harsh. Like if the judge wanted to send a message about drugs, but he knew the defendant, he knew it was a, a, an open plea and he was good friends with the defense lawyer, he sends them to, you know, 15 years or something like that. Um, this was, the, the, there's something about this that doesn't make sense. And, uh, you know, you'd have to know what the, the internal conversations were to fully understand it, which I don't. Uh, but there's something that just doesn't make any sense in terms of how a defense lawyer would conduct himself in a case like this. Um, yeah, I mean, one thing I'll say, I can say this broadly, uh, the, you know, the, the criminal justice system is a, you know, like anything else, it involves human beings. Okay, there, it's not a people tend to think of it as this like mathematical thing where you plug in facts and you get a, a, a result. Um, it's not. It, it is. It involves human beings, which means that if I'm friends with you, I can talk to you. Maybe you want to help me. Uh, maybe you know whatever. Or maybe someone is mad at someone and they want to hurt them. These are all things that enter into it. They probably shouldn't enter into it. But like any human endeavor, uh, you know, the fl the the flawed human beings that make these decisions um, often uh, allow things that shouldn't be in a perfect system, part of the decision to, to influence what they do.
I've been very involved in cannabis uh, legislation for a long time, passed Pennsylvania's law, introduced uh, the medical law, introduced the recreational law, and I travel around the country speaking on this issue um, because I think that prohibition is one of the most pernicious policies. You know, people say to me, well, I mean, I understand you, th you support this or whatever, but why is it such a priority? Because it has so many reverberations. It's a big part of our mass incarceration system. It's a big part of the decimation of minority communities. It's a huge uh, amount of money that's sucked out of the system every year for this. Um, and for just, and, and it, 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 it the existence of prohibition results in us continuing to fund violent drug cartels. So if it's safe, they don't know if it's laced with something else. A lot of people are hurt because of prohibition. Um, and I, uh, I believe this since I was 15 years old. Um, and I'm, like, I'm now like 105, right? So it's been a long time. And for a long time, I was like a, like, very few people. I went to my first marijuana conference uh, when I was uh, in the house. There were 75 people there. Well, the one I went to last year had 46,000 people. And the percentage of the population that believes in full legalization in Pennsylvania, for example, has gone over the years from 12% to about 62%. So there has been a sea change. And that sea change has been reflected in the law. So we now have, you know, uh, 37 states that allow some form of legal cannabis. This will uh, have a huge impact on people like George, who will never be brought to uh, to trial or never be charged criminally for marijuana offense, offenses eventually. Or if they are, it'll be for a much lower grade, like for example, selling without a dispensary license or something. That's going to be a very, there's no life without parole. We've also, you know, largely eliminated three strikes laws and so forth. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because criminal justice reform, which I think uh, legalizing cannabis is a big part of. But criminal justice reform has evolved into one of the few bipartisan issues. So we're very polarized, we're very tribal. However, uh, for different reasons, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, liberals and conservatives have embraced many aspects of criminal justice reform. Maybe liberals because of, you know, they think people's lives are being ruined and whatever. The conservatives, they just, it's, you know, at the end of the day, the criminal justice system is just another government program. Um, and it is a failed government program in many ways. We're spending way too much money. We get way uh, too little out of it. Um, and so like any, you know, I mean, I think a lot of conservatives I know are tired of spending their tax dollars on this. And that's why groups like the Koch brothers, that's why uh, the Chamber of Commerce, that's why Newt Gingrich, very conservative entities have said, you know, we've got to reform the criminal justice system. That's why we were able to pass the First Step Act last year, because it was a bipartisan thing. The attitudes uh, about the criminality of marijuana have changed dramatically, are going to continue to change. And that's why I think uh, this will be viewed as a inexplicable anachronism, this whole 80-year prohibition. I mean, this is a, a system that's, uh, uh, you know, steeped in racism. The results are very racist. If you're black, you're four times as likely, or uh, depending on the state, sometimes more to be arrested for cannabis, even though blacks and whites use it at the same rate. And, and if arrested, five times as likely to be incarcerated. There is nothing about prohibition that you can defend that's uh, the, that's not, uh, uh, you know, the, the, where you're not defending blatant racism. Uh, one of the things that's most interesting to me is there's a, a prison, I don't know if you've heard of it, it's called Bastoy Prison. They treat their prisoners really well. You get a very nice little bungalow, you get flat screen TV, you get recreation, you get training, you get all sorts of stuff. And people are like, oh my God, you are coddling criminals. But I would just say in response to that, their recidivism rate is uh, about a third of ours. Um, and so, and the theory of it is that, and I'm not justifying any crime or anything, but, but a lot of people are in prison, uh, you know, they've led very bad lives. They've had, they've been abused as a kid. They had grew up in great poverty. They grew up, whatever, disproportionately. 
And so they've been treated bad their whole lives. They commit a crime, we put them in prison, we treat them bad, and then we send them back out. There's no breaking of the cycle. Whereas in a place like Bastoy, people are like, you mean I can live like this all the time? Like if I just like, you know, follow the straight and narrow and all of that. And they have, you know, uh, armed robbers and every, you know, serious criminals. And they don't tend to commit crimes when they get out. So you have to ask yourself, what's the purpose of prison? Is the purpose of prison to get even with the prisoner? Um, or or is it to make them a better person when they get out of prison? And if the goal is not to retribution, but the goal is rehabilitation, uh, then I think it's very compelling. Uh, at the very least, we have to make our prisons more humane, give them opportunities, um, give them training, um, and work through some of their issues. None of that is done in prison a lot of times now. Also, we need to reduce the way too many people are in prison for too long. We incarcerate more people than any other country in the world, I think, uh, last I saw, except Cuba. And in Pennsylvania, we incorporate, incarcerate more people than any other state but Texas. So we incarcerate more people than almost anyone else in the world. We have about 5% of the world's population, about a quarter of the world's prisoners. We should have a different approach. Um, there are some people who should be in prison, absolutely. But a lot of people, you know, for nonviolent offenses, there are other things. There are punishments that we can impose upon them that will make them better, like, you know, working with people in need or working with animals or, you know, you, you know, you have to go to this class. You have to learn, you know, you have to, that seemed to me much more constructive than we're going to put you in a cage, let you rot for two years and release you and hope for the best. That is a, uh, a failed model and a failed system. It'll require some more resources to do that. But if we have fewer prisoners, we save a lot. It costs about 40, 45,000 a year per prisoner currently. Uh, if we have you know half the prisoners, that would save a ton of money that we can use to make the people who really need the help better. More constructive, more effective, more efficient uh, criminal justice system that actually does what it's supposed to do, which is uh, you know make sure that people who commit crimes don't commit them anymore, uh, make them law-abiding citizens, give them a path to being productive members of society, um, and uh, to not be punitive, but to be reconstructive and to you know get people back where they should be. That should be the focus of our criminal justice system. We've seen a little movement in that direction. I just really hope that we sustain that over time. Criminal justice is easy to demagogue. You can take the worst criminal in the world, point to that person and say, that's what we're dealing with. We shouldn't give them any breaks and we shouldn't help them. It's outrageous they get, that someone in prison goes to school. Uh, it's outrageous they get job training. Uh, I've seen in my 18 years, maybe a thousand co-sponsorship memos to increase the penalty for some crime or other. I've seen zero reducing, like proposing to reduce the sentence for a crime. A lot of the forces of politics, which is where these issues are decided in the political realm, um, push you towards just more punitive, more draconian sentencing and treatment of prisoners. Uh, but I think there's a growing feeling, at least um, in, the, in the scholarship on this, that this is counterproductive. If solitary confinement Supermax prisons, that should not exist. The psychological damage, uh, and it's one thing if someone's going to be there for the rest of their life, you can say it's immoral, but at least it's not consequential. But if someone's going to be in prison for three years and you treat them like an animal, what do you expect of them when they get out of prison? Uh, and we're not thinking about that. Uh, and, and, and so these solitary confinement, the whole, that sort of punishment, all that should not exist uh, in Pennsylvania prisons, period, um, or in anywhere in the country. Um, and that's one of the things that you know, I'm going to keep trying to talk about to try to get people to understand, regardless of how you feel about them. And I think we should all care about our fellow human beings, but regardless of that, um, it's bad for us. It's bad for society because 98% of people in prison get out. All right. And so what do we want when they get out? What do we expect of them? And what do we do to make sure that what we expect of them is realistic given how they've been treated in prison? Um, and that is, an, uh, that is a question that we need to give a lot of thought to.
I'm against that too. I think you should give them, uh, you know, a reasonable wage for the work they do that they can use. Obviously, I guess there's stuff to buy in prison, but when they get out, they need a little bit of a nest. Like they need, like you're released from prison today. How, where do you like, I mean, some people have family, but others don't or whatever. Where do you live? Where, 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 how do you get a, you know, you want to get a job interview. How do you get clothes for a job interview? How do you get uh, a vehicle to get to a job? I mean, we, we give people, I had a bill that provided tax breaks or tax credits to companies that hired recently incarcerated people, but we need to do more of that. If we expect people to be, to, to walk the straight and narrow, to be law abiding citizens, we got to give them a path to do that. I mean, if you can't earn a living, I mean, eventually any one of us would start robbing or, or stealing because, you know, you have to eat, you have to, I mean, yeah, yeah. so uh, you know, we, need a tra we need a better transition program uh, in Pennsylvania than we have. Part of that can be that you, have, you earn, you know, and then you get a sense, like you have a nest egg, 15 cents an hour is almost, it's a joke. But like, let's say I got out of prison after four or five years and I had like $10,000 that I have earned. I can use that. I can then get an apartment. I can get a car. I can get a, I can get a, a, a suit. I can get, and then I can go start, you know, trying to get job jobs and I can try to get my life together. We, we don't care what happens to people when they get out. Um, and so, uh, there are so many flaws in our system and they're self-defeating. They hurt us. They don't hurt the prison. They, you know, they, they make our streets more dangerous. They cost our, our, our tax, uh, our, you know, coffers money. Um, and I don't understand why this, we haven't, you know, we've been a republic for 240 some years. Why haven't we worked this out yet? Other countries have worked this out. We have not. Well, no, I mean, I think there's an obvious moral problem uh, with making something legal and then continuing to punish people as if it were illegal. That's why in my recreational proposal, uh, we have automatic expungement um, for marijuana related offenses. Marijuana convictions in your past would not be an impediment to you working in the uh, cannabis industry, getting a license to be a dispenser or grower or whatever. Um, I mean, this should never have been illegal in the first place. Um, and, you know, so many lives have been ruined over the last 80 years because of it, we're not going to continue to ruin people's lives even after we get rid of uh, prohibition. So, uh, you know, uh, my job uh, is to make the, uh, the day that, that that comes sooner because every day that prohibition continues to be the law in this state and in other states is an injustice where people's lives are being destroyed.